I'm really, really pleased to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Simeon Pathak, here from UCLA, the <laughs> Department of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, to talk to us about pediatric gastroenterology, gastroenterology and ASXL disorders. Um, I don't know about you all, but we call it poop and puke in my house. <laughs> and um, I guess we never imagined uh, that one day we'd be dealing with so much of it. And um, luckily we have specialists like Dr. Bathak who can, who can guide us through some of those challenges. So I'm pleased to turn it over to her. Same survey, so birth to two years, as you can see, 
um, boys and girls with BOS, they had they were very under the growth chart for both WHO um, standard percentiles. Um, and so, um, actually, let me just so if you think about weight for length, you know when you're comparing these weight and height charts in my computer system, it translates it to weight for length and it plots that. So if somebody, let's pick someone, so if they're nine months old and they're right here, right about the 60th percentile for length, this is a boy with BOS, or length, and then I went back to weight and I'm just, that same kid who's nine months old um, is tracking under the growth chart for WHO, but at the same point, so you can see how the proportionality is the important thing, not just staring at these charts and saying, oh, they are so small. Okay, and then feeding issues. So these were the big things that um, I was told are big questions that we have, and also things that are very common in children with ASXL disorders. So one thing yeah. is failure to thrive in infancy, which we talked about a minute ago, and then gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD, also known as reflux in general, poor gastric motility, so there's two big types um, to simplify it, one is the upper GI, so like stomach and above, and we have a fancy term for slow stomach, which is called gastroparesis. So when you have slower motility of the stomach, we give that diagnosis. And then constipation related to slow motility um, is lower GI, so below the stomach. But there are also constipated kids that this is due to diet and feeding and not necessarily slow motility, but in kids with ASXL disorders, a lot of the time it is due to slow motility or slower moving of the GI system. Cyclic vomiting syndrome, um, which is pretty common and it's a kind of a weird thing that we don't really know too much about, but it's important to not only for me to educate other doctors about it because I see it a lot as a PTI, but also for you guys to educate other people about it if your child has cyclic vomiting syndrome because a lot of the times you do have to go to the ER if it gets bad, and then the ER doctors may not know how to treat it properly and may try other things. So we'll talk about cyclic vomiting syndrome a lot. And then with cyclic vomiting syndrome, when you don't have a diagnosis, or even if you do, it's important to rule out other things to make sure that you aren't missing something that could be causing this vomiting and just calling it cyclic vomiting syndrome. For example, malrotation, Dr. Russell has written in her research that that is seen in ASXL disorder as well. And then feeding tubes, G-tubes, G-J tubes, we see these all the time in my clinic and um, you know they can be scary at first, but as you guys probably know, if you have a kid with a G-tube or G-J tube after a while, it's just second nature. Uh, but it can scare other people who aren't used to it and so it's nice to not only teach other pediatricians about it, but also for you guys to teach your pediatricians or your ER doctors about it, so in case you are having a problem, you know a lot of information about it. Um, so, okay, so we're gonna talk about GERD first, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Um, so, symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease in general are vomiting, cough could be one, feeding refusal could be one, Arching of the back is very common during feeds. Um, oops, sorry for my typo. Chest symptoms, patients will complain of heartburn. Sometimes if they can't speak, they will also kind of hold their throat or their chest because they're feeling uncomfortable during feeds, right before feed or after feeds. There are also other things that can cause these problems, so it's very important to talk to your doctors about it to see if this is reflux related or it's something else. So that's why history is really important. That's why like, if you come to see me or another GI, we'll ask you a million trillion questions to try to figure out, okay, is it before feeds, is it after feeds, is it morning, is it night, is it this, is it that, is it with this food, is it with that food? So history is truly, truly important, so that's very helpful from parents. And then there are some studies that we do if we're not quite sure, is this reflux or is this not? Um, sometimes we do need to do endoscopy to take a better look inside. Sometimes we will do something called a pH probe study. Um, which is technically the gold standard for looking at reflux, but do I scope and do a pH probe study on everybody who comes in with reflux? No, because it's very invasive. But 
if I am treating for reflux and things aren't getting better and I want to investigate more, then these are some of the studies we do do. And the pH probe study oftentimes is done with the scope or without a scope, and it's when you place a small pH probe through the child's nose into their esophagus, and you can capture actual real-life data of um, reflux or you know food coming up and down, and there's a little probe that's capturing that data, and then you can it's attached to like a little monitor computer, and you push if the patient's having symptoms at that moment, so you can tell if this is normal reflux, because there's normal amounts of acid reflux, or pathologic acid reflux, meaning GERD or disease form. Treatment, so um, number one thing that we always talk about is reflux precautions. So reflux precautions are basically lifestyle things, diet-related things. The big thing that you guys have probably heard of um, if your child deals with reflux is keeping them upright during feeds, after feeds. Um, and then there's other reflux precautions and dietary things. Antiacids we often use, they reduce symptoms, they promote healing because it lowers the acid content of the stomach. And so if uh, food or acid is coming up, it decreases the chance that that will, that will cause inflammation of the esophagus or stomach, which then causes pain or ulceration. And then it prevents long-term complications and they decrease uh, feeding intolerance as well. And the feeding intolerance usually develops because Patients feel those discomforting symptoms, and then when they feel those, then they associate that with food, and then they're not interested in eating. <clears throat> if, if a child has very severe um, gastroesophageal reflux, there are some surgical options, and one of them is called a Nissen blend application. Sometimes it's done with a pyloroplasty, and these are all just fancy terms that the surgeons use, but basically, if you have an anatomical issue or a ton of reflux, the surgeons can go in and fix the esophagus and the stomach from doing a lot of reflux activity up and down. And it's for very severe situations um, or if you have like severe ulcerations because of the severe reflux. So we only use it, as I've said a million times, severe, severe, severe. We don't use it for kids who are just dealing with reflux. If somebody, if you concerned, there was a question if, um, how do I know the Nissen is still intact? My kid has a Nissen and I'm not quite sure. Um, then you can do an upper GI study, which is a x-ray type radiological study where you can pass um, diagnostic pictures and see if there's any indication that that surgical Nissen thing has unwrapped. So that is one question I got, so I just wanted to answer that very quickly. Um, and then, as you can imagine, if somebody has GERD or reflux plus slow motility issues, it, beco it becomes a little bit harder to treat because when someone's stomach is moving slow or the stomach and intest intestines are moving slow, then they're more likely going to have food or stomach contents refluxing up. So then you kind of have to attack the problem higher up and lower down. With medications, usually lifestyle things are also very, very important. So that's why I always talk about both when treating these problems. And then in terms of reflux in general, you can see with this anatomical chart of this figure, stick figure, that there are a lot of different parts that play into um, the anatomy of somebody starting from when they swallow food to the time they food goes down into their esophagus and into their stomach. So different causes of reflux could be that this, these sphincters, the upper esophageal sphincter or the lower esophageal sphincter down here are relaxing at the wrong times, allowing food to go into locations they're not supposed to at the wrong time. Or you could have this impaired esophageal clearance, so you can have issues with the esophagus itself that could cause increased reflux. Um, you could have, in, under secondary mechanisms, there are issues with abdominal pressure. If you have significant intra-abdominal pressure, that could cause increased movement upwards. So it's kind of all like a plumbing system, all attached. So if you have issues above or below, you are going to cause issues in the middle. Um, delayed gastric emptying we talked about. And then, let's see, these are... Okay, so anti-reflux diet. So a lot of the times parents will say, okay, we're treating with a anti-reflux medicine, but I want to know 
what should I feed my kid because I want to try to decrease this from happening. Some things are not under your control, like we talked about the sphincters, etc. You try your best um, to keep them upright to help with that. But there are foods that can increase acid in the stomach, and so those are listed here. Citrus fruits and juices, high fat foods, fried foods, full fat dairy products at times. And these are for some people, not all, so if these are not triggers for your child, then don't worry about it. But it's oftentimes um, helpful to do a food diary and monitor for symptoms because then if you do find trigger foods, it's really great when you find that information because then you can lower it in your diet. <clears throat> Peppers and onions for some people, spicy food for many people. Um, tomato products, especially you know ones that are very acidic. Large portions at one time, eating at one time. And then other foods and drinks, so caffeine, including chocolate, coffee, soda, tea. Carbonated beverages are also under this category. Chocolate, darker the chocolate, the more caffeine and the more things that increase reflux. Peppermint and spearmint as well. So those are some of the things you could kind of think about in the diet and see if they trigger reflux. Other anti-reflux recommendations, I touched on this. Eating small, frequent meals are very helpful for anybody with reflux or even if you guys have heartburn experiences in the past, you want to eat small, frequent meals. No one does well with big, large meals, even though that's kind of a traditional thing we've all been. Let's sit down and have a big breakfast, a big lunch, a big dinner, but it's not very great for the gut. It puts it under a lot of stress. Um, spend time walking after a meal to help you digest. So this is, you know, you'll see a lot of elderly people, grandma and grandpas, going for a walk after they eat their meal. And the reason is, it's actually very good for digestion. So. Sometimes what our elderly people do, or our elders do, are very uh, reasonable things because they've been passed on generation to generation and there's some science behind it. Um, avoid laying down at least two hours after eating meals. So this is a big one for after dinner because a lot of times we're doing all these activities, dinner gets pushed later and later and then we go to bed soon after dinner. So try two hours is hard, but try you know, one and a half even if you can that decreases reflux uh, on a full stomach when lying down. Sleep with the head elevated. Hard to do for some people because we always move around in our sleep, but you can try. And then maintaining a healthy weight is really important. Um, being overweight contributes to reflux as well. And regular exercise. Okay, next topic is gastrophoresis. So gastrophoresis is that fancy term for slow stomach movement. Um, and this has been seen in uh, AXSL disorders. So uh, the standard gastric emptying study, which is what we order when we're wondering if somebody does have slow stomach emptying because they're having a ton of reflux or they may be vomiting or they may be um, you know, not able to take a lot of feeds at one time that they should be able to take. So we order a gastric emptying study, and it's basically a um, marker study where you can see how fast the stomach actually empties over time its contents. So it's considered normal if at the two hour mark, greater than 40% of the stomach content has emptied, and then at the four hour mark, greater than 90% has emptied. Um, and this study, as you can imagine, is slow. So when you do have to go do it, um, you're there for a while because we take pictures at the half hour mark, two hour mark, four hour mark, but it is very helpful if you are wondering if somebody does have slow gastric emptying. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's not reasonable to have to do this study and spend the whole day there, and there's enough history given by parents for me, so I will discuss empiric treatment, and empiric treatment basically means that we just start the gastrocrisis medications and lifestyle changes to see if it helps us tolerate better the feeds. So treatment is frequent small meals, medications, and then low fat, easy to digest meals. A lot of the times that's like not um, you know anything greasy, not anything too high fat, and not anything too high protein, so easy to digest foods. If someone is on um, formula feeds, then oftentimes we will space the feeds out too and make them more smaller feeds so that they can tolerate better. 
but meditations are very helpful in this problem. Okay, next is cyclic vomiting syndrome. Okay, so the criteria for cyclic vomiting syndrome is greater than five vomiting attacks in an interval or greater than two episodes over six months. And the way um, the normal symptoms for cyclic vomiting syndrome, uh, syndrome is unremitting paroxysmal vomiting attacks. So they really do look like vomiting attacks and they can last from one hour to 10 days, like when the episode, oops, sorry, when the episode's happening. Um, and then they're at least one week apart. So patients will often have this like very stereotypical pattern where parents describe that they are vomiting continuously for like, let's say an hour and then it stops. And in between vomiting attacks, they are completely back to their baseline. Um, and then the other very important thing is symptoms cannot be attributed to another cause. So when you do think someone is having cyclic vomiting syndrome or they're vomiting a lot in general, as a GI, I do quite a bit of workup to rule out other things before I say that this is cyclic vomiting syndrome because like I said, there's other things that are really important to rule out and not just assume. Um, complications of cyclic vomiting syndrome can be dehydration, that's a big one. Esophagitis, because stomach content is coming up into the esophagus and the esophagus, the tissue in the esophagus is not prepared for such high acid content, so it can cause a lot of inflammation in there. Tooth decay, because it's coming up and into the mouth. And then Mallory Weiss tears are a description of when there's a lot of retching in a patient and um, a lot of the times patients who have cyclic vomiting syndrome do retch a lot. So when they're retching, um, which you know, they're kind of going like that, <laughs> that type of um, in between the actual vomiting, uh, it can cause a lot of pressure and a lot of um, inflammation to the esophagus and the, can actually cause little tears and sometimes that's why you'll see blood in vomit. So what is cyclic vomiting syndrome? What causes it? We actually don't know. We think based on the studies and literature and research that it may be in the family of or related to migraine headaches, um, but there is some research that there it could have a mitochondrial association so it could be more passed on on the mom's side of um, the genetics. And um, there is a lot of literature that says if there is a migraine history in the family, kids are more commonly having more cyclic vomiting syndrome. But then also kids with ASXL disorders, for example, there may not be migraine history. So like I said, there's so much that's still unknown about this syndrome. Um, and then there's also possible neuroendocrine association for this disorder. Um, it could be because the patient's having episodic dysautonomia where everything in episodes is kind of in a disarray of heart rate and blood pressure and then it goes back to normal and you don't really understand or have an explanation to why. Could also be there is an increased hypothalamic stress response that causes this activated emesis surge vomiting all of a sudden. So there's still so much to learn about the reason why somebody gets this and somebody else doesn't. And then under cyclic vomiting syndrome, so these are the things that are very helpful for um, us to remember and understand about patients who are struggling with this because there are phases. So there's a well phase we talked about. This is really important in cyclic vomiting syndrome to remember because if the patient is not returning to a well phase, then they do not have cyclic vomiting syndrome. There's a well phase where everything's dandy and fine. Then there's a prodrome where you know something's gonna happen. Then there's the emesis phase, which is the most active part, and then recovery. So the reason these phases are important is because um, they each, phase that the child is in, you would treat them differently, whether you're at home or in the hospital. And we'll come back to treatment. Um, like I said, I think I described some of these already. The clinical photo is intense vomiting, sometimes retching, dehydration is um, a big part of cyclic vomiting syndrome that we have to combat. It often starts in the morning. And then the other interesting thing is there are common triggers that can cause cyclic vomiting syndrome. So psychological triggers, but also physical triggers. 
Um, psychological triggers could be both positive things that are really exciting, like we're going to Disney World tomorrow, versus something really sad, versus I'm in pain. Physical triggers, um, in general, you know, I gave a list here. So infection, stress, sleep deprivation, overexertion, fasting, meaning not eating during scheduled meal times, allergies, even menstrual cycles. And then food triggers can also um, put people into this kind of cyclic vomiting thing. So chocolate, certain cheeses, spicy caffeine could also do it. So it's kind of um, interesting and important to also keep a food diary with this syndrome. Um, and not only just a food diary, but also other little notes because you may catch some patterns and then it's very helpful to know every time this happens, it could trigger. So how do I prevent this from happening or how do I help um, my kid? Other features of cyclic vomiting syndrome in children are pallor, so they can, their face can turn pale. They could be listless, where they're kind of looking very weak, retching. We talked about possible abdominal pain, possible headaches, possible photophobia. I talked about how this can is related to the migraine family a little bit, so that's where the headache photophobia comes in. Um, they may prefer darker rooms, quieter rooms, and then. In terms of mental status, they're oriented, they know where they are, they know who you are, but they may prefer not to talk or to respond because of the intense nausea. And then prophylactic medications. So when somebody is in the, um, you know, when we're talking about the phases, we'll just go back to this. When someone's in the well phase, the top one, there are prophylactic medications sometimes we will give to patients if they're having very frequent um, episodes where we don't want them to have those, those often. So if episodes are greater than um, one every one to two months, or if the episodes are quite severe where we're constantly going to the ER, or if you are struggling because the medicines you are given for home are not, the child is not responding well to those medications um, or therapies. So some examples are ciproheptadine, Amitriptyline, which is a, um, so ciproheptadine is a like allergy medicine initially that was invented for. Amitriptyline is actually a um, neuromodulator, so it's often used for um, severe GI pain, or it can also be used for depression, anxiety. So it's used for a lot of different things. Propranolol is used for um, heart conditions, but it's also used for this as well because it helps that um, we talked a little bit about like heart rates or blood pressure is going to serrate, so it keeps everything stable. So that's another medicine that's used to stop these from happening. There are others as well. So if these, if this sounds interesting to you, definitely talk to your doctor to see if your child is a good um, candidate for prophylactic medication. And then treatment by phase. So we talked about phases being important because at every phase, it's important to about what the child needs at that moment. So prodrome is when you're like, okay, something's about to happen. I've seen this type of prodrome before. Um, Anti-nausea meds are huge here. One that we use for cyclic vomiting syndrome often is called Zofran or Ondansetron. It's available in both oral forms and IV, so they are used in the ER as well. Anti-acid meds are very helpful here because you are prepping the body because you know it's probably gonna start vomiting soon. And so you're helping the body by um, lowering the acid content of the stomach in advance. And pain meds, so you don't always know if pain is happening, but in general, when someone has cyclic vomiting syndrome, if you use the combination of the meds, including a pain med, you get a better response. And at home, it could be something as simple as, you know, uh, Motrin. Vomiting phase, so, this is kind of that phase where you can think of it as a migraine as well, even though it's not a migraine, it's cyclic vomiting syndrome. Um, so dark, quiet room, low stim, no noise, no yelling. Um, Anti-nausea meds are helpful here too. Pain meds are helpful here. So you want to have a very quiet, dark, reassuring um, environment while the child is vomiting. If it, everything is failing and um, you know, you're really struggling at this point, then we also sometimes will prescribe sedative meds or a very common one that's well known is Benadryl over the counter. 
could be used here too because if the anti-nausea meds are not kicking it, another way to have somebody stop vomiting if it's going overboard is to make them sleepy and go to sleep. And then always, I always tell families, if you, at this point, it's not getting better, you're worried the child is getting super dehydrated, it's very important to go to the ER because we need IV fluid. Um, if you're past this phase then, and then you're at home, recovery phase, um, you know, it is a cycle. So when you're in the recovery phase, the child has just vomited, and you have a few moments, maybe in an hour, you have an hour, you have two hours, you want to take advantage of these in-between vomiting phases where they're back to their baseline because you want to give them as much fluids and glucose as you can, not overdoing it, but giving them what's tolerated. And the, the key is glucose and electrolytes here because um, the thing that works against you as well as when your glucose and electrolytes are low because you've been vomiting, it could also make you more nauseous. So that's why you want to use this time to give broth, Sprite, fruit juice, um, sports drinks, Pedialyte. And then if you're unable to keep anything down here, then again, it's advice to go to the ER for IV fluids. Well phase, we talked about just a tad with preventative meds, but important here is to get enough sleep every night, treat infections and allergies promptly because these are physical stressors on the body, decreasing stress for the patient, and avoiding triggers. And then if you have experienced um, a bad cyclic vomiting episode at home or even in the ER, it's always great to take notes to figure out what helped because certain people respond to certain medicines or a certain combo. And then if you have those um, notes or if your doctor has those notes, they could even write it down for you so that in case you need to go to ER another time, you can give that note or letter to your doctor and say, my child has cyclic vomiting syndrome, you know, please rule out other things, but if we decide to treat this like cyclic vomiting syndrome, he or she or they um, respond best to this regimen. So then the ER physician knows, okay, this is how I treat it. Because unfortunately, um, many ER physicians, they're trained to you know, take care of something acutely, but they've not been trained in something as um, you know, cyclic vomiting syndrome because it is a little bit of a niche of a syndrome. Constipation. Okay, let's see how much time Okay, I have three minutes, so I'm gonna move faster. <laughs> Okay, uh, constipation, so what is it? It's a decrease in frequency or painful passage of bowel movements. So you could have very regular stools, but they're painful and hard to get out. Why does it happen? There could be organic reasons uh, where there's some sort of problem happening, causing the slow uh, movement of the uh, intestines and colon, or it could be a functional reason. So functional is usually diet-related, toilet training-related, withholding-related, pain-related. But in ASX cell disorders, obviously we have a organic reason um, for slowing motility, but it is also important to remember not everybody has slow motility in ASX cell disorders as well as um, other children. So it's important to also talk about those things like diet, toilet training, withholding, check the bottom to make sure there's no cuts or lesions that, you know, for adults we push through the pain, we know we gotta poop, for kids, they're like, I'm not pooping, this hurts, I'm gonna hold it inside, I don't care what you say. <laughs> so retained stools can cause stretching of colon and rectum, increased retention, you can think of it as like a bowl at the bottom. Um, the rectum gets very stretched when stools are being retained. And then the body tries to conserve water, so it'll draw water out of the poop, and then these poops get harder and harder and bigger and bigger. And then when it is time to come out, the kid is pushing them and it can cause pain and tears and all that stuff. So we don't like constipation, we wanna keep it away as much as possible, especially when we're worried about slow motility and someone having underlying issues that could increase risk of constipation at baseline. So a lot of the times, and I'm sure you guys have heard these a million times, we'll do clean outs and follow up by maintenance therapy. So clean out is done to get everything out so we can start at a clean slate and then move forward with little bits of medicines. Um, oftentimes we do clean outs with Miralax for kids because it's very easily tolerated and it's just a stool softener. And then maintenance therapies, we usually, if you do have slow motility, we usually do a combination of something that's more stimulant to say, tell the gut you gotta go, and then something that's gonna soften the stool like Miralax. But 
like I said, everybody is different, every person is different, everybody feeds differently, so it's important to remember there are a lot of different treatment modalities for constipation. So if Miralax didn't work, for example, for you, or you know, you tried, for example, Sada before and it didn't work, then give some feedback to your pediatrician or your PTI and say, this combo didn't work for me, or these doses didn't work, what else can we do to treat this? constipation because there are many other options. There isn't just like one thing. These are some examples of commonly used meds we use in constipation in kids. Some are over the counter, some are um, prescription. And then fluids, fluids, fluids are very important in constipation. Okay, feeding tubes. So I wanted to include some information about feeding tubes and some pictures. So feeding tubes are used in children who are having trouble eating by mouth and oh, that's my alarm. Okay, I'll talk for two more minutes and then <laughs> we'll open the questions. Um, there's different types of feeding tubes. And, oops, I was supposed to write down the different um, companies, but I didn't get to that part, so sorry about that. Um, there's G tubes and then there's GJ tubes. So G tubes oh. go directly into the stomach, and I all oftentimes describe it as a earring because. It's going directly into the stomach um, and it's just passing a little bit of tissue and then sitting there. And these feeds that go through a G-tube, we like to do bolus feeds, that's our goal, which means quick feeds at one time. And the other options, if, if a child can't tolerate bolus feeds, is we do intermittent feeding or continuous feeding. With GJ tubes, we use GJ tubes when somebody cannot tolerate feeds into the stomach at all. And so we're bypassing the stomach and we're feeding into the small bowel and you can imagine this is not normal feeding, you know, you don't feed into the small bowel. So we only use this when we absolutely have to. Um, indications could be severe risk of aspiration, severe gastroparesis, meaning the stomach is really not moving at all, severe GERD, where we're also worried that things are gonna come up. Um, there's different types of GJ tubes, depending on what company that is put in. And then with GJ tubes, you have to do continuous feeds, you can't do bolus feeds because the intestines don't blow up like the stomach does and go back down. So these are our G-tubes um, types. This one is very common in the GI world because we actually place them ourselves as Pete's GI doctors. They're called PEG tubes. They're um, known as um, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomies and that's because we do them while we're scoping. So you can see the baby doll in the middle has a PEG tube right there and these don't come out and get replaced like other g-tubes do so they stay for a long time for example we have adults that we see in our enteral clinic who had the same peg tube that they got placed when they were babies so they can last for a long period of time and then this is a different type of g-tube it's called a mic it's long um, so it kind of sits on the skin and then comes out here and then these are the cords for feeding or the balloon um, these are usually placed by surgeons initially, and then we um, support families after that with the actual tube and feeding. This is a Mickey button. These are very, um, very popular because you can hide them under outfits, and they're not really in the way, and so they kind of look like a button. This part inside is the balloon that holds it in place, and then this part is, um, you know, the feeding port. And then there are two common um, types that are used. Um, the Mickey button is one company by, uh, by Avanos makes that one, and then the other one is the AMT Mini. And a lot of times if your Mickey button G-tube is leaking a lot, you can try switching to a Mini because as you can see, their balloons are different um, shapes, so it may help with leakage. So if that's a problem you have, you can talk to your doctor about that. And then these are GJ2 pictures. So, you know, they are clunky, they're big. We don't like to use them unless we have to. In babies, we definitely try not to use them. So there is a weight requirement for placement because they are chunky and we don't want to ever um, have somebody's intestine um, open up because of the tube itself. Um, and then quickly, troubleshooting G2 leakages. So, often related to movement or inadequate stabilization of the tube so it's important first to just look at the tube itself gently pull back to ensure that the balloon and the
bumper is placed there correctly. I always tell parents to check the G tube first before placing it because you never know if you get a manufacturing issue G tube. Check the balloon weekly and make sure that the skin level ones are appropriate length for the patient. Um, how to prevent clogging, which is the number one problem with G tubes is, or GJ tubes, is frequent flushing before meds, after feeds, before feeds. Um, and then this is kind of a unclogging tube main guideline. Obviously, you can ask your physician or nurse for help if this happens, but first line is you try to use water, warm water, and push it through the syringe. Second line is you can use papaya enzyme mixed with warm water and kind of instill it in there. Keep it, basically let it eat whatever is clogging the G-tube and then push it in. And then the other one is um, pancreatolite paste. So these can be um, prescribed by your physician if you're having troubles and then you can dwell it in there and then push it in. So those are very important to remember. And then you can also have granulomas as kind of a, a side effect of the G-tube. Um, moisture and friction are enemies, so you, I always say avoid dressings because a lot of the time you want to keep clothes clean, so we'll put a dressing on the YouTube, but it's not the front of the skin to do that, so try to protect the skin by leaving it open like a earring. Uh -huh. um, okay, that's it. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Sometimes the body, you feel like her body is just not moving at all. Upper GI or lower GI yeah. kind of shuts down how to prevent this from getting worse. Yeah. So I would say there are different medicines that work for the upper GI and different medicines that work for the lower GI for a motility issue. It sounds like this could be a motility issue where things are not moving very well. So I would discuss with your GI if, there, if she could try um, one or two of those meds to see if you can keep, give something consistently to keep things moving so that then you aren't worried, oh gosh, everything's shutting down now, what do I do? Because once things stop moving, then you know, you're know you more into like, I need something quick, but if we can give something to keep things moving and prevent it from getting into the real emergency um, phase, then that would be best. Um, one is called Reglan. We use it pretty often in kids. It works well for the upper slow motility issues. Ciproheptadine, um, I use it for the appetite stimulant part of the medicine that's helpful. It can also help with pain. Um, it's used for other things too, but I don't think it will help that much in the motility issue. Or doesn't he, you know, it seems like he can tolerate to eat um, 
about 40% orally, and then we can also see a bunch of fees that probably are due to fees too. Mm -hmm. And we'll just see where I'm done that tells us. We'll be at the table, and I see eight grade, and I'm like, yes, so you hit your calories, no fees, and then I'll turn around, and half an hour later, he'll so just vomit out of nowhere, and he plays, and he's fine. Mm -hmm. So I'm really like, yeah, you know, you know, yeah, I, I don't think that sounds like cyclic vomiting. Okay. It probably sounds like just slower motility of the stomach. So even though he probably wants to eat fast when he's hungry and gets to eat by mouth, um, I would try to slow it down a little bit. Like, okay. okay, eat this, maybe play a little game here, and then eat more. Okay. And then I always recommend doing um, oral feeds first and then followed by G2 feeds. Yes, that's exactly what it is. Perfect. And so it may be an overeating issue. It may be um, you know too fast and okay. the stomach is just slower to move after. If he is vomiting, I do recommend venting the G-tube, so open it up, and if you can connect the tubing and a little bag to vent it, okay. um, or even connect the tubing to a syringe to vent it, that's great because when you do have a G-tube and you're vomiting or retching, it releases some of that pressure and it can um, stop your vomiting much quicker. Oh, so as he's vomiting, you can both, open it up? Yeah, and vent it up. Okay. <laughs> But something worth discussing too with your doctors, if it's getting worse, because you don't want him to vomit too much. Yeah, I was like, but then he's fine, and then I can, you know, do less of calories and start, and then yeah. target his numbers, and that's why I'm not sure. Yeah. So it could be formula related, blend rice food related, if you're doing blended foods, um, timing of meals, a lot of little things that could be tweaked to make it better. Okay. So let's take one more question, and then we have a break between this and the next session. So I'm sure Dr. Prasad will be willing to stick around and, and talk to you individually. So let's take the question in the back. We've got a question on the other end. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie was diagnosed with megacolon. Uh -huh. uh, so they've been wanting us to keep her very loose. Uh -huh. uh, but then we run into the problem that she's technically got constipation, but we're always dealing with diarrhea. Um, so right now they've got her on two different meds. They've got her on Senna and Melcoff. try tweaking those meds and try a different combo of the two because it is nicer to be on the looser end with this problem but too loose is also not good and then too hard obviously will cause other issues so you could try tweaking type of meds and also doses to see if you can get it just a little bit more pound and not as loose and then the other thing you could do if it is a, a lower GI motility issue you could try to ask your GI about a med that specifically works on the lower GI to make that move um, move for you more versus doing, uh, you know, you would still have to do stool softeners, but it may help with the problem of movement versus just making the poop super quickly. There's a couple for lower GI. One of them is um, hard to get uh, approved by insurance, but sometimes if you do a prior op, it can, it can um, work. Um, I think it's called Pro Promotil. Yeah. We use Augmentin. Say that again? We use a low dose of Augmentin. Oh, yeah. That could work too. Everybody is different, and there's so many options. So, uh, erythromycin is also used as another antibiotic for motility issues. So, part of options. But if you don't like what you're doing, if it's not working, try something else, because there are a lot of options.